Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today for this uh, very exciting discussion about the use of the terms Hispanic, Latina, Latino, Latina, Latino, Latinx, anything that we can actually think about uh, uh, how to describe uh, the community and individuals with uh, from a Latino with Latin American backgrounds. So I'm Jacqueline Quiroz, an associate professor at the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital at the Harvard Medical School, and I'm the director of the Multicultural Alzheimer's Prevention Program that uh, is the one organizing this event. So that explains that uh, many of the, the invited uh, panel at least uh, uh, have been working with uh, Alzheimer's disease or other aging, um, doing other aging research. So today I have the, the great honor and pleasure to be uh, moderating the session with um, my friend and colleague, Dr. Luis Medina. Uh, Luis, you wanna say something? I'm happy to be here. Thank you for um, for inviting me and actually for organizing this. I think that this is a, a, a conversation that's been happening sort of uh, behind the scenes in a lot of different academic groups and outside of academia. Uh, so it's nice to, to be able to discuss this uh, uh, more publicly and in, uh, in a cross disciplinary and multidisciplinary manner. Perfect. Uh and yes, and we're going to be uh, giving you some background on why we think that it's, this is a, a good time to have this discussion. Um, this is probably the first one. We only have one hour to start the, the conversation. So the goal is not to uh, come up with a, a like a final agreement in one hour, but at least to start the conversation, right? This is something that I personally think uh, it needs to be uh, more uh, discussed, especially um, among the ones working directly with with the community and doing research with the community. So uh, hopefully in the future, we can uh, schedule a follow-up uh, discussion. So you have the QA option at the bottom. So uh, since time is very limited, we may not go through all the questions, but we can keep the questions for future uh, discussions as well. So please feel free to include your questions there. So now I am so excited. Let me see if everybody's here. All right. So excited to uh, introduce the, the panelists, uh, the invited panelists for this discussion. So we have, a, let me see if I can close this too. So we have an amazing group of uh, panelists and uh, we're gonna hear more from them um, as we continue with the discussion. But I, I wanted to uh, thank all of them for accepting the invitation, for taking the time to meet with us today. And the same as I mentioned, just uh, let's just start the conversation. Let's hear what uh, everybody will then think about the use of these terms and trying to learn as much as we can as we move forward with the discussion. But with the, the goal in mind that this is not like something that we need to uh, solve or decide or come to get to an agreement in one hour. So so it's an effort, and I think that the response to these panelists speaks of the, their commitment uh, and also their interest in these topics. And um, so thank you again for, for taking the time. I appreciate it. So now in the, just to give you a few, uh, yeah, pretty much the, the agenda for today in this hour. So uh, uh, Dr. Luis Medina is gonna give us a, a overview of why we're having this conversation. Then I will uh, summarize some of the findings that were uh, recently reported in, in Pew, uh, and like at the survey that they conducted. So I'm gonna briefly summarize that. And then we have some questions for the panelists. So we will hear from them. And is we have whatever time we have left, so we will open up for the questions that we get in the QA. So this meeting is recorded, so hopefully in the future we can also go back and uh, revisit uh, many of these uh, topics. So, uh, uh, Luis? Great, thank you. I just have very few slides just to <clears throat> um, kind of ground us uh, sort of uh, historically and, and why this uh, why we're having this conversation to begin with. So I pulled a couple of these slides actually from a, a recent class that I had um, with some undergrads uh, uh, here at University of Houston. Um, and, uh, and so I'll, I'll pull from that. And so this concept of Latinidad and, and what that means in order to uh, group a, a, a very diverse and heterogeneous uh, community or a set of communities and, and understanding that uh, the, the challenges here is, is not accepting the, um, the general understanding that, that, um, that 
uh, Latin American communities are diverse and heterogeneous and not a solitary block. Um, but when we are describing um, some of these communities in our own research or in our own uh, um, publications and, and, pr and products, how we categorize them or how we, we label them. And so I, I really enjoyed this model that was presented earlier this year um, by um, a scholar um, who's been looking at, at culture and, and how best we can uh, conceptualize the system that, that describes these cultural groups. And, and so this P model of culture that describes uh, cultures as, as uh, uh, a system of people, practices, and places, the processes that combine them, and all of this is in the context of power. And so I had a, a recent conversation uh, regarding the power of naming and, uh, and what that uh, what that historically, politically, socially means uh, throughout um, throughout uh, scholarship and, and, and academia. Um, for those thinking that Latinidad is all about um, uh, Spanish speaking, uh, this is just a, a quick graphic of the, the all the different Spanish speaking countries. Uh, if uh, if we were to use that, but interestingly, in a recent Pew. Uh, survey, the uh, uh, only about 45% of those surveyed considered speaking Spanish as part of Latinidad or, or, or identity uh, within these communities. The term um, Hispanic, uh, one of the, the most commonly used terms um, still to this day, was introduced uh, in the Nixon era for the 1970 census. Uh, Grace Flores Hughes uh, herself uh, admits to to uh, being one of the people who coined it uh, and uh, reported using this term as a way of reflecting the, the commonly used uh, term uh, Hispano across uh, Latin American communities. Uh, and then the, the term Latin or Latino, Latina, or sometimes shown with an at sign uh, was popularized in the U.S. around the same time as the term Hispanic by largely Mexican and Puerto Rican communities living in the United States. Uh, in the continental U.S. and uh, this term, uh, these terms actually existed throughout Latin America before, well before com uh, becoming common in the United States. There has been some debate in terms of who is Hispanic and who is Latino, Latin, Latina, uh, and uh, not everyone agrees with uh, with uh, the differentiations. There are some. Uh, folks uh, that believe that Hispanic uh, includes uh, Spain and most of the Latin American countries, but does not include Brazil, uh, where the term um, Latin or the, its, its variants include everything on the west side, but not Spain. Uh, in some cases, Latin includes uh, Brazil. In other cases, it doesn't. And in some cases, it includes the Caribbean um, Spanish-speaking countries like Puerto Rico, or uh, Puerto Rico not being a country, but uh, uh, Puerto Rico uh, being a territory, and the Dominican Republic and Cuba, um, who are uh, also uh, Spanish-speaking countries. Um, and in some cases, Latin does not include them. So uh, still not a lot of harmony or, or agreement in all of this. And part of the reason why we're having this conversation today, and this is my last slide, is um, this term Latinx, which um, it's unclear uh, when it started, um, but was popularized after an, an, uh, a very unfortunate event um, in 2016 in Florida. Uh, the shooting at the Pulse nightclub, and I unfortunately had um, friends who were there uh, that night, and um, many who identify as, as non-binary, many who identify as uh, sexual orientation or gender identity um, members, uh, diverse groups of diverse groups. This term was used after the shooting to uh, capture the breadth of the gender spectrum um, that was unfortunately massacred that night. And so it's an inclusive term that's intended to sidestep the traditional gendered convention of Latina and Latino um, uh, to reflect uh, the um, masculine or feminine, feminine, masculine, respectively. Uh, and so this term, which is uh, the convention of trying to non-gender Spanish language is not anything new, as some of our panelists will discuss today. 
um, but it is something that has caused uh, quite a discussion, quite a debate um, throughout many different communities. Um, and so that is why we're, we're here today. And so I will um, pass it back to Yaquel. Um, thank you. Yaquel, you're muted. I'm going to summarize some of the, the findings that were recently reported by Pew. And uh, this is just to give you like a, a connection to what uh, Luis was mentioning. So the Hispanic population in the US also is a uh, very diverse and not just uh, in terms of gender, but also in the uh, um, yeah, pretty much it's very diverse. And some of the, the key questions that they, they, they had trying to respond is kind of like, okay, so who are the Hispanics? Who are the Latinos? Especially the ones living in the US. And this is taken for the, the census, the last census, when it shows that about 50 million people uh, self-identify uh, pretty much as uh, belonging to the Latino groups and just showing like where they actually coming from in, in general. So you can see that, as I was mentioning here, so even beyond the, the terms of Hispanics or Latinos, there is also the terms of like the, the country that you are coming from. And this is something that has been reported that pretty much about half of the Hispanics, they, they said that they most often describe themselves by their family's country of origin or heritage and uh, using the terms such as uh, Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Etc. And uh, almost 39 percent of them describe themselves as Hispanics or Latinos, and they prefer that term uh, compared to other terms. So most recently, and they also uh, like in, in celebration of everything that is happening to the uh, celebrating the Hispanic uh, Heritage Month, they included uh, some data that most of the, the Hispanics that actually live in the U.S. They actually think that uh, speaking Spanish uh, is the most important part of the Hispanic identity across immigrant generation. And uh, the immigrant generation is something that we are going to uh, try to discuss uh, today because uh, it could be like the, the terms that we are using also uh, depend on that uh, are related to that immigrant generation is you are a foreign born, is you are first generation, second generation, third or higher generation in the U.S. So in this uh, survey that uh, they published uh, uh, recently, uh, actually in August, so they showed that uh, most of the, the people uh, interviewed, and this is about 3,000 people that they interviewed, they said that they had not heard of the word uh, Latinx, and it's about 76%. And out of the ones that they, they reported hearing about the term, only 3% of them actually said that they used it. So this, uh, like, uh, uh, this is kind of like one of the motivations of having a meetings like this, because if it is true, and I think that there is no discussion of the importance of having a more like a gender a neutral term. So uh, the question about if this is the best word it remains since it seems that no, a lot of people are using it. Could be like part of the process, but that we're gonna be discussing that in a few minutes. So they also said like, uh, even if it is getting a uh, popularity and as Luis mentioned, especially uh, after the unfortunate events in 2016. So uh, this 3% is like, uh, remains a question, who are these 3%? And they show like, even looking at the, who uh, are belonging to this 3%, that is the young people, uh, especially the ones between the ages of 18 or 19 or 18 and 29, that are most likely to be aware of the term in particular, and the women in this age range seems to be using it more. But even in that context, they were saying that only 7% actually use the word to describe themselves. And the other interesting finding that they reported is that it seems like among this group of young individuals, the ones that actually are uh, with college or higher uh, college educated or higher uh, education, or those that are US born uh, and they are English speakers as well, are more likely to use it. So other considerations there when thinking about the terms. These are two other graphs that they included in the report. That uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention here is like the same, like even when they were asked uh, what is the term that they will use, 
that if we, we consider more a pan-ethnic or in other words, gender neutral, they say that they would actually prefer a, a, the Hispanic and the Latino um, followed by the Latinx. So like this is something there that I think that it requires some attention and it's a point of discussion. As mentioned as well, like uh, something very interesting is like the Latinx had gained a popularity, especially since 2016. This is something that we can see in the publications when you actually uh, do searches by, by the term. But even that, the, the other terms like Latinos or Hispanics uh, are still a more, are, are mean more use compared to the other ones as well. So there are several uh, comments, uh, commentaries that have been a, a yeah, published uh, lately. And this is one that I was reading that um, somebody actually asked about the, the pronunciation of the word. And uh, she said in this one that if you can say cleanness, you can actually say a uh, Latinx. This is something that uh, Ed Morales, the author of the, the book, Latinx, the New Force in American Politics and Culture, uh, mentioned. Uh, but there are some uh, other, uh, other people that argue that Latinx is, a Anglic is an Anglicization or a colony, uh, okay, mm -hmm. an attack against the Spanish culture. Well, it's something that is interesting, I think that uh, I'm very excited that we have uh, somebody that's actually uh, leading and advocating for this as well. Like in some Latin American countries, they are actually use another, another, another gender neutral form that is substituting the A and R for the A, for the E. So I mean, like instead of saying Latina, Latino, they are starting saying Latine. So that's other option and something that deserves also a discussion. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to a, so yes, actually, so maybe a Luis, you wanna start asking the first question to the speakers, the plan, the panelists. And I think that for the first one, since a, it's a very rich a group, and let me just put a, let's gonna put this slide again, so you can see them. So for the first uh, question, I think that it would be great to hear from everybody that I was invited to, to be part of the panel. Since we are a, we have eight people, so I would say little, we can keep the first response to two or three minutes. That would be great. So we can have a, an opportunity to go through our questions as well. So I'm gonna keep a time. So <laughs> two or three minutes maximum. Uh, okay, Luis, go for it. Yes, uh, the first question that we have for the panelists is, which term do you use when referring to people with a Latin American background or heritage and why? And we'll start with, well, the first person on here is James Lee. So we'll start there. Or maybe because I know that uh, many of you uh, don't know each other. So is you can just in one sentence, uh, say your name, your affiliation. I think that will be great so everybody can get to know you as well. So James, thank you for coming and be here. Sure, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, my name is James Lee. Uh, I uh, originally from Brownsville, Texas uh, in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, uh, most southern part of our state, if you're not familiar with Texas. Uh, I live in Houston um, and I uh, actually created a website um, specifically on this issue for the term Latina, uh, it's called comilatina.com um, as a resource for information uh, about this term, uh, the background um, and the uses. Um, and uh, I, I do wanna acknowledge my fellow Cougs on this call uh, and uh, fellow Texans. Um, thank you for the invitation for being here. Um, when uh, I do refer to our community, um, I typically, if we're talking about public um, or within government, uh, my background is working within uh, public policy and government affairs for uh, the state's largest community health center system. Um, whenever I'm talking about Latinidad or people of Latinidad, I do say Latino or Hispanic, but I do promote uh, Latina as a, a neutral term um, and an opportunity for people to uh, discuss this as an alternative to Latinx um, for those who might need it. Great, thank you. Next up, Dr. Monica Rivera-Mint. Good morning, everybody. It's a 
real honor to be here with this amazing uh, panel and with uh, Dr. Medina and Dr. Quito. So thank you to all and MGH for uh, putting this together. Uh, so again, my name is Monica Rivera Mint. I am a board certifi certified neuropsychologist. I study the intersection between cultural neuroscience and health disparities. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology at Fordham University and uh, in New York City. I have a joint appointment there in the Latin American and Latino Studies Institute. And I also conduct my research through my joint appointment in neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, personally, I use the term uh, Latinx and uh, I've used that term now for, uh, for a number of years. Um, uh, and I, I understand that this, if we're gonna talk more about this later and I understand that it's important to think about this in terms of uh, having culturally and developmentally tailored terms for the people that you're working with. But for me personally, uh, I find that this term is more inclusive and, um, and for me in terms of gender identity as a, as a cisgender woman, but also as the parent of a transgender child, uh, to me having uh, the acknowledgement of intersectionality and inclusion of our non-binary friends and uh, uh, individuals for whom uh, this binary idea of male and female uh, just doesn't bend it is extremely important. So this was important to me uh, before, but even more so because of my personal experience and um, and I and I and who I use it with uh, it interpersonally depends on who I'm talking to, and I'll be happy to talk more about that uh, later, and also uh, be happy to comment about uh, the changing identity uh, or the terminology of identity in our um, in our community over the last hundred years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the slide, we have uh, Dr. Miguel Arce Renteria. Hi. Uh, yes, likewise, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. This is a, a very cool debate. Um, and thank you, Jaquel and, and Luis, uh, for organizing this. Uh, so, yeah, so my name is Miguel Arce Renteria. I'm originally Juana, Mexico. Uh, I identify as a, as a cis heterosexual uh, man. Uh, I'm a neuropsychologist. Uh, I'm an associate research scientist in the Taub Institute at the Columbia University Medical Center. And I do uh, cognitive aging, uh, disparities in cognitive aging research with a focus on Latinx. And so with that, you'll see that that's the term I, I, I tend to prefer to use. And actually, I think fun fact, I was mentored by Dr. Monica Rivera Minta throughout grad school. Uh, so Yes, yeah, so, so I, I as well prefer to use the Latinx term uh, specifically when using it in, in, in general discourse and as using it as a, as a plural, right? As opposed to focusing on the more masculine centric heavy word of like saying Latino, Latinos. Uh, and so Latinx, I think for me just captures all of that, captures Latino, Latina, like the plural and also the most important part where obviously that it'll capture those who are generally not really studied, included a lot in, 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 our, in our studies of aging, which would be the, the, those who identify as, as non-binary. And and so, and in Spanish, actually, I do. So for me, in English, I'm using Latinx, and in Spanish, I've been using Latine, Latines, uh, uh, trying to. It, 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 I've just recently started using that within like the last year, I believe, uh, because like from what was argued earlier, yes, I do think Latinx might be a little bit trickier to use in Spanish than actual, because then switching it for every, because in Spanish, obviously, every word is gendered. Um, but Latine is what I've noticed in my own personal experiences, uh, both academic and, you know, and personal. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, uh, Dr. Maria Martinez. Hi, good morning. Pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. I think it's great that we're having this uh, conversation. Uh, so my name is Maria Martine and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, my research centers on disparities in cognitive aging in uh, Hispanic, Latinos, Latinx, uh, with and without HIV. Uh, so I am originally, I think there was a question posted to the, or a comment posted to the panel about our backgrounds, and I think it's an important one. Uh, so I am, because I think it shapes quite a bit of what, you know, where we are at this point with the different terms. So I'm originally from Uruguay in South America, and I immigrated to the U.S. as a young adult. I've been here for 20 years now. Um, and uh, really, still to this day, the, the term that I feel identifies me the most is Uruguayan. Uh, I, if I talk about myself, I, I refer to myself as from Uruguay or Uruguayan. Um, and, uh, but I, I use all of the terms uh, in my research, in my personal life. I 
value all of them. I think that there are pros and weaknesses to all of them. I tend to, when I write papers the first time, and when I do scholarly presentations the first time that I talk about the group, mention all of the terms and then say either I'm going to use different ones through my presentation or I might stick to one. I, I think that that represents kind of the diversity of our culture and I love that that's represented via different terms. Uh, so you know my bias from the get go. I, I, I So that, that's my take on depending on the audience on who I'm talking with, I might uh, go more towards using one term more consistently than the other. But, uh, or, you know, I've, I've been in, in publications that I know some people have very strong opinions against using a certain term, and I try to respect that. Uh, but I try to be as open and as flexible in how, how I do refer to these terms. I think they're all valuable, and I think differences should be celebrated and respected. So that's my take on it. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we have a close colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Arturo Hernandez. Thanks. Thanks. For, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. And, and it is a it is quite eye opening. So I, I am a colleague of Luis Medina. I'm at the University of Houston Department of Psychology. My area is in neural bases of language, of bilingualism specifically. And so, um, and and I've also um, grown up a little bit in my background. I grew up simultaneous bilingual. So I literally spent you know lots of time with my fam, my mom's fam, my mostly my mom's family, but my dad's family as well in Mexico. Um, lots of time as a child um, and also summers uh, for many years and at 14 a year. Um, then later I learned Portuguese as an, as an adult um, and later now uh, trying, I'm working on trying to learn German. And so the idea of gender, which is an interesting sort of concept, right, which is really marked uh, as a psycholinguist, linguists use the term marked and I've had some exposure to psycholinguistics and linguistics. Um, what they mean is it's actually coded in the language, right? So gender is coded in Spanish, it's coded in, in Portuguese, in Brazilian Portuguese as well. And it's coded in German. And in German, there are actually three genders. So there's masculine, feminine, neuter. So they're actually words that have no gender. Um, so my whole thinking about, my whole sort of concept of gender has just been completely corroded because, and I'll use that word because you know, in all these different languages, words can have different genders. And so really, and in English, of course, the only gender that exists is what I call sex or what, you know, linguists would call sex gender, right? And so for me, it's really kind of an interesting question because when I say Latino or Latina, right? And I realize that Spanish, because it's a language that came from Latin where there were three genders and it lost one of them, we now have a binary gender in Spanish, but in, in German, which is more like Latin, there's three. And so I get really all tossed up by this. And so I was talking to my daughter yesterday and I was trying to figure out, okay, what should I say? Cause she's younger and she's more hip and she'll tell me not to say some things and say others. And, and I told her, you know, if I'm speaking in English, I'll just use the term Hispanic because it's an English term and I'm in English. And if I'm in Spanish, I'll say Latino. And if I was in German, I'd use some other term, right? And so, I kind of get lost in this whole conversation because the sense of gender is to me at least much more represented linguistically. And so it loses its sexed aspect. On the other hand, I do respect and understand why people would worry about that being binary. Um, and so I certainly respect anybody's you know, choice, but I would use, I would continue using Latino and, and I would say la gente Latina, right? As well, which is feminine um, in Spanish. I would use whatever three genders I needed to use in German, and I would use uh, Hispanic and English because um, there is no grammatical gender. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Dr. Caleb Esteban. Hi, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm assistant professor at Ponce de Science University at the clinical psychology program that we have. Um, I use the term Latinx when I'm writing in English but in Spanish, I'm moving to using the letter U as a plural pronoun. Um, we are writing and debating about the E because the letter E is used in Spanish for uh, representing masculine too. Like if you talk about trabajadores, empleadores, um, you are referring to masculine 
So the letter O and E is using for masculine. So maybe using the E as neutral is not that neutral. Um, so we respect the letter E for when we talk about non-binary people. Um, so we ask if the E is like a personal pronouns or the E is like a ruler pronouns that is inclusive because sometimes binary people say they don't feel comfortable with the letter E as inclusive because they don't feel that the letter E represent them. So um, we are like making some research. We are writing a lot of it. I'm comfortable with the, like every approach, um, but I'm glad that those spaces are open to talk about it, to see if there is a problem with the E. Actually, I was doing research and I have no idea who was the first person who had the approach of using the E. So we are like using the E, but we doesn't even know who approached the E or why, or if, is there a problem using the E or that kind of stuff. So, but in English, um, I use the letter X because if I use the U, I think when people read it, they will think it's a typo or something. So I am getting there and moving. Um, so, yeah. Gracias, Boricua. Uh, oh. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Gladys Maestre. Gladys, I think uh, she froze. So we'll, oh, Gladys, you're muted. There you go. Or Gladys, you're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Gladys Maestre. I'm a professor of neuroscience and human genetics and the director of the Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley uh, in, in Brownsville, Texas, at the border with Mexico. Um, so I think uh, when I think, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you so much, uh, Jaquil, for the invitation. I really appreciate it. So I think when I, I, I have to divide when I'm talking about myself and when I'm writing or speaking um, to the public about uh, Alzheimer's and also if I'm talking to colleagues. When I talk about myself, definitely I am a Latina, you know, and I always try to introduce myself as a Latina. Uh, and uh, I, I feel very proud of that. You know, it's just, you know, some people say, well, it's a stereotype. I'm like, well, I'm a Latina. That's what I feel. That's what I like to show. And, you know, it doesn't bother me. You know, it's like saying I'm a woman. You know, it's, to me, it's natural. It's my natural language to refer to myself as a Latina. When I was in, in Boston and later in New York, I, you know, was introduced to the term Hispanic, basically because of the, uh, a Puerto Rican and a Caribbean, Hispanic Caribbeans residing in this area. So it was natural to me. When I moved to Miami, I was like more exposed to Latin American and the difference between Latin American as referring to uh, for, uh, born in, in any of the countries that Yaquil shows. And now that I'm in Texas, really the term, um, Mexican American is what makes the feel that the people feel like they belong. When I ask them about Hispanic, they, you know, they are not sure if it's people from Spain that do not relate to them. And when I use the word Latino, they relate more. When I ask in focus groups, what about um, Latinx, Latin, um, they never heard of that. My participants and. Um, so the participants at the, at the level of the population. So I have to go back to what they use most, which is the Mexican American, Mexican American culture. And when I am talking in different presentations, I, I quickly adapt. If I'm giving this presentation in California, I will use the word Latinos, Latinas, or Latinx. 
So I like the diversity and I like to be able to pick and choose without having to really, um, you know, pick or speak. In the presentations, as I, I do as Maria, um, and uh, in my writings, I usually uh, define what I'm going to keep using. I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, uh, that resonated with me as somebody who's also moved around a lot uh, and been exposed to uh, different norms and uh, regional norms and, and uh, sociopolitical norms. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, can we have Joseph Betancourt on here, um, but I don't see him on our panel. Oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Dr. Joseph Betancourt. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation as well. And just by way of background, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, grew up in New York City and, and Puerto Rico as a child. And I'm a primary care doctor here at Mass General, been here for almost 20 years. And about 70% of my patients are Spanish speaking from a, a whole variety of different uh, Latino and Latina nations. Um, and so I, I, I'd say a couple of things, uh, just from a principle standpoint, I'd say um, number one for me, words uh, absolutely matter. Um, and number two, I fundamentally understand and respect that the terms evolve. And uh, I also believe it's incredibly important as we evolve language that it be respectful uh, and inclusive. Um, and I have, you know, up until, you know, all my life identified myself as uh, uh, Puerto Rican, as Puerto Rican, but um, I think have identified with Latino or Latina and really became, you know, become like many of us more familiar with, with the term Latinx over time and then different variations of this. And I'd say that, that just personally, I, I struggle um, with it. I think the, the Pew research um, that uh, the team shared, you know, demonstrating that 25% that of, of Latino survey uh, I have heard the term 3% use it. When I kind of um, just in the last bunch of months talk to my patients or talk to even my team, um, who are all from, from Latin American countries, they, they are not familiar with it. I guess because you're not familiar with it doesn't mean the term should evolve, but I, I believe that today as we lead an event here at MGH to, to celebrate what had been called Hispanic Heritage Month, today we called it Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic Heritage Month, right? We have evolved to be inclusive uh, in those ways. And so I guess what, what I'm, what I hope is that we can evolve this conversation. I guess the, the part that that um, that I'm struggling with is it's that Latinx has become the default among non-Latino Latinos in what they call us. And I guess what I'm pushing for is that that we have that. Uh, I think as, as somebody mentioned earlier, that sense of inclusivity to both be allowed to have choice and to be inclusive and perhaps use multiple terms. But I'm I'm really interested in, in learning. Uh, I think from this conversation, I think fundamentally what we know, no doubt, is that in our nations, gender-based discrimination and violence is a major issue. So this is not something that we can simply brush aside or make as an academic debate because the language we use and how that's managed in our countries fundamentally is a major problem. Uh, but that's kind of my, my struggle around it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, so far I've kind of defaulted to kind of using Latino, Latina, Latinx to make sure that everybody feels included uh, in this discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you for contributing that. And there was a, a question in the Q&A regarding um, uh, when you ask in surveys about ethnicity, do you just use one term or do you include different alternatives? And, and, uh, and one of the responses was, um, I'm trying to provide as many options as possible. And, and, and we all alluded to this in, in one way or another, but do we feel that uh, these terms are context-based or, or driven by the situation in which um, we may uh, prefer to use one over the other rather than a, a truly fundamental black and white argument of never use this one, always use that one? And I will open that up since uh, everyone's introduced themselves. So do um, what are folks' thoughts on uh, in terms of uh, when to use these and, and the context and, and situational aspects of that? So I have thoughts. <laughs> uh, so briefly, I, I there was a question about our, our backgrounds. And since I went early, I just briefly want to say that uh, I was raised in Southern California. I'm Afro-Latinx and indigenous. Uh, my mother is from Colombia and she's indígena. My father is from um, Puerto Rico and he's uh, Afro-Caribbean. Afro so I also have a, a, a 
various uh, perspectives that I come from. And, and also I grew up as a minority within a minority as a Puerto Rican Colombian indigenous, you know, Afro Latinx um, girl growing up in SoCal where the, it was major the, the majority minority was Mexican American or, or Chicanx. And so for me, I think that as we talk about this and we think about this, we have to put it in a historical perspective first because it is complicated. But the broader historical perspective, if we take a step back, and I know people have strong feelings about different terms, and even uh, uh, Lewis, I love that you even brought up first to what what it what makes somebody you know Latin Lat, Latinx or Hispanic or whatever term you're going to use. Who who are we? Which is so existential and fundamental. And um, for me, if we look at the history. Uh, we come from an imperialist colonialist history, right? And I understand that uh, that there are concerns, for instance, about using uh, words like um, maybe Latinx uh, because it's more of an anglified term that's come out of the United States. And, and I feel that and I get that. Uh, but at the same time, for, on the other side of that, to use a term like, Lat, uh, like Hispanic for me, for, for, and again, for me personally, I'm also the immediate past president of the Hispanic Neuropsychological Society, which is an organization that I'm very proud of and proud to be part of. But uh, that term is complicated to me because it comes out of this uh, colonialist heritage where the term itself means of Spain. And for many of us who um, are Latin American or, or identify as Latinx, um, having us simply defined by our colonialist imperialist past is hurtful and it's difficult for us, especially those for many reasons, um, for those of us who also identify as indigenous and, and other things. So I think uh, there's a lot of complexity with that term his, Hispanic, especially for, this, for those of us who identify with uh, the genocide of, uh, of what happened in the Americas. And then those who oppose the term Latinx uh, might also argue in terms of language that part of the problem also is that it's a romance language and it goes against language and, and actually using that term as an imperialist, a, a, a form of linguistic imperialism. But what I would argue is that the fact that we're speaking Spanish is already linguistic imperialism because we're not speaking in indigenous languages, right? We're not speaking the languages that, that were spoken before the, the you know, our, 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 our lands were colonized. So I think that, that we have to think about this in, in those broader terms historically and also in the United States for the last hundred years, every census, what, how we have been defined has changed um, except for the last two sentences, uh, censuses, 2010 and 2020 is the first time our, our terminology has been uh, defined. So I also really resonate with the point about us defining ourselves and why there has to be room and space for that. And I think that's extremely important. Um, and, and at the same time, I hope that we can have compassion for each other for whatever we decide is our is our preference. And, and I think especially at this moment where we have uh, people in our community are locked up in basically internment camps, women, uh, you know, Latinx or Hispanic or whatever term you want to use, we have women who are having procedures um, that are being uh, thrust upon them in, in these uh, in these centers, uh, gynecological experiences without their consent and, and without their understanding. And we have children separated from families and we have this tremendous political moment. Thank you, um, Mara, yeah, I, I just think we have to think about all of this as, as we think about the terms and, and think about what brings us together more than what separates us. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I, I, I understand the, the passion uh, and I appreciate that. I do want to uh, make sure that we have time for everyone to, to speak as well. Uh, and also you, you brought up uh, um, some really uh, great points that I would like to, to hear other thoughts from the, the, the panelists. Um, if I could just interject here, um, you know, I think I'm in the minority here and using the term Latina. Um, I know earlier it was mentioned that a lot of uh, masculine words in Spanish end with the letter E, but so do feminine words. When we talk about la clase, la torre, when we talk about other words like la sangre, la gente, right? The, the, the idea behind using the letter E, right, is that within the Spanish language, there's often a use of articles, right, that then determine that word's uh, identity as masculine or feminine. Um, and so that is why within a lot of Spanish speaking countries, you've seen Latina being used as an alternative, right? Um, and, you know, I think a, an important conversation here too that often um, is kind of overlooked when we're talking about our identities here is, first of all, um, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, right, I grew up in Brownsville, Texas, the most southern part of Texas. 
Um, I am a gay man, right, and a cisgender gay man. And uh, I grew up in a very conservative Roman Catholic family, right? Um, so there's multiple identities for me and, and reasons to identify here, but the history of uh, queer people, right? People who are non-binary, people who identify under the queer umbrella um, is naming themselves, right? Um, it's a history of naming themselves. And so um, I think it's very important to remember that we all have different identities for different reasons and none of them are invalid, right? Um, when it comes to that individual. Um, but as you know, I think was mentioned earlier, um, when it comes to identifying an entire population based off of an identity that others might not agree with, that's where we run into a little bit of trouble, right? Um, and I think a really important piece to the conversation that's often unfortunately overlooked um, when we're talking about um, you know, issues of Latinidad, Latino, Hispanic identity uh, within the United States is that, you know, a lot of the conversation uh, when it comes to self-identifying uh, tends to be focused on the larger populations, uh, major metropolitan regions. Um, and when, you, when we think about that, right, um, who leads the discussion within the nation? Uh, it goes to the Northeast, it goes to California, right? It goes to the coasts, right? Um, and then, you know, you have, me, myself, right, I grew up in the most southern tip of Texas and, uh, you know, a lot of our identity um, is, uh, you know, I think like, like Gladys mentioned earlier, um, related back to being Mexican American. Um, and a, a, a lot of what's overlooked here, I think that's an important piece as we talk about imperialism and colonialism, uh, is that, you know, large swaths of the United States were once Mexico and once that population, um, or excuse me, once, uh, you know, the United States then, you know, acquired these pieces, these large groups of land where people lived and were Mexicans, um, those people were then immediately discriminated against, right? Those people were told to assimilate um, and threatened to assimilate or die or had their land stolen from them through, a, you know, quote unquote, legal documents. Um, and so we're talking about imperialism within the context also of within the United States own borders, right? Um, and so from my background coming and growing up as a queer person, as a Mexican American, um, noticing the conversations within my communities um, is that, you know, especially when we're talking about our community here, um, is that there is sort of, you know, a, a history of oppression, a history of racism, right, that affects our community um, and an attachment in a, a, to the Spanish language, to our cultural identity um, that we see, um, you know, the folks in the larger, uh, more recognized regions within the country um, uh, have a voice um, that is somewhat louder than our own, right, for, for whatever reason that is, maybe it's because, you know, major news networks uh, and companies and organizations and major politicians are within those regions. Um, but often I think the voices of, of those people are overlooked and it's unfortunate when we have a situation where, you know, the president of the United States um, often refers to Mexicans, right, as the problem. Um, but then people of Mexican American descent, um, people who are Mexican American um, are often sort of left out of the conversation. Thank you, uh, James. Yeah, Kel, did you want to take over for the next question? I know we, uh, we in the I interest of time, we have about 10 minutes left. Exactly, I think that because we have only 10 minutes and there are some questions already in the QA. So I think that maybe we can uh, give the opportunity to the ones listening to ask more questions. Um, so yeah, so one of the, I don't, let me see if I can give uh, my loom. I mean, I'm gonna see if yeah, Maria has a question. Uh, Maria, you can talk now. Thank you so much. I do have a question and thank you for sharing everything. My name is Maria Carrillo from the Alzheimer's Association, uh, Mexican American as well, first generation born in the United States. But my question is really about um, sort of, you know, how we as an organization should be thinking about this. And I, I, I very much appreciate um, all of your comments and, and your perspectives. For us, for example, um, our organization really focuses on individuals that are generally over 55. And uh, whether we're talking about Latin American background, uh, we're talking about African American background, whatever, or, or you know, primarily 
white background. But my question to you is, if that is the the uh, that if that is the demographic, it is also the demographic that in uh, Yaquel's and maybe Luis's slides, we also saw that it was less resonant with them to talk about Latinx. So they, for them in the United States, perhaps it's more common to think of Hispanic or to be labeled as their country of origin. So how does an organization like ours um, ensure that we are using appropriate language, but also sensitive to the demographic that we also serve, which is generally 55 and over, almost 65 and over. So that's my question to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That's, a, that's a great question that, uh, that actually ties in really nicely to the next question that we had uh, regarding the generational aspects and generational context of, of some of these terms. So. so Maria or Gladys, just to try to give people the opportunity to talk. Do you want to mention something? Do you want to say something uh, to Maria Carrillo? Sure. Yeah. Hi, Maria. I think we've met in the past a long time ago uh, when I was in Chicago. Um, so uh, what I can say is that I, I, I feel like the way that I try to do it, the best way to be respectful of certain of the population that I work with is to ask the population what they prefer uh, with some. So because I think there's so many different varieties. I know we get the data from the Pew, but, you know, there's regional differences. There's um, country of origin differences, their generational differences. In my experience, again, in the older age group, which is much of the research that I do, when I talk with the community here in California, people prefer Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, and, and I use those terms. Um, I, um, I, I've also used the term, uh, the term Hispanic quite a bit, and I completely see Monica's point that she raised earlier, and I respect it, and I and I hear it, and that's why you know in a lot of the papers that we have worked together, I don't use it because I know she's strongly against it, so I'm not going to use it because I respect it. I I typically do use it in a lot of my research uh, because for me Hispanic means from Spanish-speaking country and Spanish to me defines who I am quite a bit and, and the population that I work with for most of my research is among Spanish speakers that are of Hispanic, Latino, Latinx descent. And so um, I use that term. So I'm going back to that question of context dependent and so forth. So, so uh, and for me, yeah, the Spanish speaking, the immigrant experience is something that unites uh, Latinos, Latinx quite a bit, even if you immigrated or your family did or you know, you speak another language. And so that's for me quite that 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 term still quite has a lot of use. I also use it in addition to the others. Um, so in any case, I got to a little bit of both questions that were raised before. I hope that helps you. Thank you, uh, Maria. Gladys, do you want to add something to that? Yes, briefly, I I um, totally see it from the social marketing aspect of recruitment and dissemination. So we need to have different channels, different strategies for different public. Even when we go uh, in, in different areas, um, we, we know what the demographics of the zip codes are and we target our messages. It takes time, more effort, but I think that is the most respectful thing we can do because we don't want, we want to, I think we want to go back to identity and values of the population. And we educate too, but we don't try to change them. We try to present to them different options, but get closer to the, the values that they are living with. Thank you. Uh, just because of time, so we still have like two two comments from the, the attendees. So uh, Dr. Malu Tansi, you wanna uh, comment? Uh, sure. Good morning, everybody. I think this has been an incredibly educational uh, webinar for me uh, as a uh, Mexican American. Uh, I said, you know, born on the border, um, uh, uh, Mexican parents, uh, bilingual. Buenos, buenos dias a todos. Um, I, you know, I was a little self conscious about, you know, is it Latinx, Latino, Latinas? Um, I think the real important thing to me right now is for us to come across as being more interested in the issues that really affect us um, as a community of color. 
um, you know, the racial inequalities that we need to tackle both in terms of research disparities um, that all of you guys are so incredibly leading us forward in. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's sort of tomato, tomato in many ways. And I, and I don't want to belittle it because I think it does matter. But my, for me, we need to widen the tent and, and make the circle bigger to, to, as Monica said, you know, make people feel included um, as part of the, you know, diversity and inclusion conversation. But I think we just need to not, you know, not come across as drowning, oh boy, not come across as drowning in a glass of water, but maybe, you know, tackle the issues of, of um, racial disparities that affect people of color, all colors, mixed colors, um, and, and, and use the terms that make people feel comfortable. But thank you so much for taking thank time to do this. Thank you for the comment. And just like in the last few minutes that we have, so Jorge, Dr. Jorge Libre, you wanna mention uh, your question? I think that after that, we uh, need to wrap up. Thank you, hey, Jorge. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jackie. And I think it's great that we are talking this. Uh, I mean, I, I, was born, I was born in Cuba, been living in the US for, oh, I mean, the last three years, no more than that. And I do feel that's, uh, I mean, the first question I had actually for the panelists is how does uh, Latinos living in Latin America will feel with the term Latins? Is that a term that uh, it is used or, or not? And how do people will feel? And, and sometimes I'm afraid that by, by having these terms, we are kind of creating a US centered view and influence Latin American culture and how people living in Latin America and feel around that term. So I don't know if there is more research around that uh, or is that something we should explore. Now that I've heard the panelists, there are a lot of points that I was not aware of. And I think that the view uh, that Monica shared definitely makes more clear why using the term, but I think that reaching out to Latin American countries, how they feel it's a valid question. Thank you, Jorge. Anybody wants to respond to, to Jorge? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to respond. Um, I, I mean, I, I think a lot about that. And, and actually, I kind of was thinking about a comment made earlier about, you know, the fact that, you know, there's there's a lot of ethnic mixing, right? So you might look at me today. I My mom decided to do ancestry DNA many years ago. So she gave me this as a gift. And so I found out that just like every other Mexican, I'm 8%, 7% African. And you know, 30% indigenous, even though the way I look would not show you that. Um, and so I think it's important to consider that no matter how you look, right? If you have, unless you're Luis Miguel, right? And I'll some talk about generational, who was literally brought from Spain, you know, and the mom's Italian into Mexico. Um, unless you're him, right? You're mixed, right? So I think that's really important to consider, and I think that really does widen the tent. I do, I do want to reflect a little bit on, you know, what seems to me like really a product of an Anglo-Spanish war, right? You know, we have this sort of old colonial war that was fought between the English and the Spanish that they brought to this continent. And we could throw the French in there too, right? And we could throw the Portuguese as well. And I feel like there's that conflict that we're still kind of trying to play out include and include also as well, all of the ethnic mixing Afro, Indigenous, and uh, European. So that that I think that that's a really important point to bring out. You know, um, who's who's leading whom, right? Who, who are we as as a population, right? And I think that this question really brings us in the U.S. Ironically, brings us to this very sort of different, inclusive view of what Latino, Latinx, Latina is that includes a lot of ethnic mixing that in some not in all, but in some and in many quarters of Latin America sometimes is seen as, um, you know, has its own hierarchy um, around ethnicity. I have a- you, Yeah, I think that we had, we, unfortunately we ran out of time. So we are gonna be disconnected really soon. So, like, <laughs> so uh, just, just to wrap up, 
Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead just to wrap up, I wanted to thank all of the panelists and and great, yeah. great contributions and uh, and and something that I think really came up and resonated throughout uh, the hour was the idea of respect and inclusion, and and so I really admire that from all of these different options, ultimately respecting people in the way that they identify uh, themselves and, and, and being able to portray that and carry that forward. And, and, and I love um, Dr. Tanzi's uh, comment about uh, making the tent larger and, and really widening the circle. So I thank you all for, for making this a, 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 a very uh, vibrant conversation and discussion, um, but one that resonated with this uh, notion of respect and inclusion. Yeah, I just wanted to listen, echo that. Thank you so much for a, being willing to, to be part of this conversation. As I mentioned at the beginning, hopefully it's not going to be the last time that we discuss this issue. I think that it's a process. But I, as uh, Luis said, I think that it highlights the, the importance of working on this together, you know, and trying to be inclusive and respectful of everybody. And yeah, so I think that just the fact that we have having this conversation, I think that it's a huge step. I, the way that I see it. And, and thank you everybody for joining and the, the ones uh, for asking the questions as well. So this has been recorded. So we are gonna make the recording available. And as I mentioned, so hopefully in the future, we can also continue this conversation uh, if uh, the panelists will be open to continue conversation. So thank you so much and have a good day. <laughs>